Lionel, 19th April, 1915. An imperious need has forced me to return to this confidant of my seekings and the efforts of my soul. All external circumstances have changed, giving a flat lie to the dream of the ideal which sought expression even in material activities. The hour has not yet come for joyful realizations in outer physical things. The physical being is plunged once again into the dull, monotonous night from which it wanted to withdraw too hastily. And thy realized will, O Lord of Truth, has come to tell the constructing mind. You don't think this is true, and yet it is. The mind has readily recognized that it was mistaken and has surrendered completely to all that thou willest. The vital being is quiet and satisfied in all circumstances. All feeling dwells in an equal and pure peace. The whole being is flooded with thy vast, eternal light. Thy love penetrates and animates it. And yet, the impression that outer facts are a falsehood has not been effaced. And the body, despite its indisputable goodwill, is so profoundly shaken that it cannot manage to regain its equilibrium and health. The entire earthly life of this being, from its very beginning to the present moment, gives it the impression of an unreal dream. Very remote from it, having almost no further contact with it, all this outer mechanism is now only a machine which it moves, for such is the will of its central reality. But it is no longer interested in it, perhaps sometimes even less than the neighboring mechanism or even the unknown mechanism that will be the product of the earth of tomorrow. But this earth itself is strange to it and as it is not aware of anything else except the eternal silence, all life that has form appears remote and almost unreal to it. It seems strange to it that anyone could desire anything since it does not exist, or prefer one thing to another since neither is there. But at the same time, it does not see why it should object to any action whatever it may be, since all actions are equally unreal, and it does not feel the necessity to flee from a world which does not exist and cannot be a burden, since its existence is so inexistent. All this gives the feeling of a sort of void full of light, peace, immensity, eluding all form and all definition. It is the naught, but a naught which is real and can last eternally, for it is, even while having the perfect immensity of that which is not. Poor words which try to say what silence itself 
cannot express. The condition thus trying to define itself in awkward terms gradually settled in some weeks ago and every passing day establishes it more definitively, more deeply, more irremediably, so to speak, without having wanted it, sought for it or desired it. The being sinks deeper and deeper into it, also gradually losing consciousness of itself in a consciousness which is no longer individual and whose immobility is inexpressible. A consciousness from which it is no longer possible to distinguish oneself. 24th May 1915 One day, O Lord, Thou didst teach my mind that it could act fully as an instrument of manifestation of Thy divine truth, as an intermediary of Thy eternal will, without being limited in its realizing constructions by the narrow field of possibilities of the external being. Till then, this mind, except very rarely, was in the habit of coming out of its mute ecstasy, its silent contemplation before thy ineffable infinity, only to concentrate its effort on the centre of action represented by the external being. And this was a sort of bondage within too narrow a frame. There was a contradiction between the powers of mental realisation and the instrument through which they were striving to make their way out. The most immediate result was the wastage and limitation of mental energies, which, not finding any satisfaction in activity, quite naturally returned to merge into thy eternity. Suddenly thou didst put an end to this disorder, Thou didst liberate the mind from its last fetters. Thou didst teach it to be freely active through all forms and no longer exclusively through those it considered till then as its own, that is, as its natural means of expression. The vital being had already realized this liberation long ago and knew how to enjoy the plenitude of sensations and emotions in all forms capable of manifesting life. But the mental being had not yet learnt how to animate, organize and illuminate consciously all lives without distinction. Thou didst break down all barriers. Thou didst open to it the doors of thy infinite manifestation. Within a few days, the new conquest was established, affirmed. And what thou expectest from the centre of consciousness represented at present upon earth by my whole being, grew clear before it to be the life in all material forms, the thought organizing and using this life in all forms, the love widening, enlightening, intensifying, uniting all the varied elements of this thought, and thus, through a total identification, 
with the manifested world to be able to intervene with full power in its transformations on the other hand by a perfect surrender to the supreme principle to become aware of the truth and the eternal will that manifests it through this identification having become the faithful servant and sure intermediary of the divine will and uniting this conscious identification with the principle to the conscious identification with its becoming to mold and model consciously the love mind and life of the becoming in accordance with the law of truth of the principle this is how the individual being can be the conscious mediator between the absolute truth and the manifested universe and intervene in the slow uncertain march of the yoga of nature in order to give it the swiftness intensity and sureness of the divine yoga this is how in certain periods the entire terrestrial life seems to cross miraculously over stages which at other times would require thousands of years to traverse at present o lord the state of perfect and conscious surrender to thy eternal will is as far as i can tell constant invariable behind every act every movement of the mind the vital or the body this imperturbable calm this deep peaceful unchanging bliss which never leave me are they not a proof of this passive or receptive identification with life thought and love in all manifested forms is an accomplished fact apparently the inevitable consequence of surrender to pure truth but the moments when consciousness becomes effectively the life animating and molding all material forms the intelligence organizing life and the love illuminating the intelligence in an active and fully conscious way at once in the totality and the least detail with a sense of infinite plenitude and precise powers these moments are still intermittent though growing more and more frequent and lasting it is in these moments that the two consciousnesses are simultaneous and fuse into a single almost indescribable ineffable consciousness in which are united immutable eternity and eternal movement it is in these moments that the present work begins to be accomplished